take a look at you know, one of these slides. That's a very good tool. It really works. Yeah, it, it yeah. seems like really robust. Yeah. Well, and it's very much makes it easy to learn Cisco networking because it really imitates the routers very well. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, then you're at your infrastructure. So you got to know all what you have. This is the first thing. Most people just have a sprawling network with junk all over the place, and they don't even know like how many machines they have or what versions they're running of stuff. And you need to know all that. You need to have a survey, your network documentation. Um, this, for example, happened to the city of San Francisco when they had a crooked uh, guy in charge of IT in San Francisco. He had snuck in by concealing his four felonies in Texas for armed robbery. And now that he was in there, he installed unauthorized equipment all through the network to lay him remote access from elsewhere, unauthorized like modems that he could dial in and control it from elsewhere and locked everybody out. And uh, he was such a scary, violent guy that he intimidated his junior administrators into like concealing the fact that he'd locked all of them out. He was the only one that could do anything. And then eventually he locked everybody out of the network. It became a nationwide scandal. Gavin Newsom, our mayor at the time, had to visit him in prison twice to get the password to get back <laughs> in the network. It was, it was a case that uh, set a lot of, ex a lot of. You can get the password out of, a, out of a human. It's Gavin Newsom. <laughs> it was, it was a worldwide uh, scandal, and the prosecutor took my um, forensic course and gave guest lectures several times. The he, was, he was notable. Conrad, Conrad Rosario was the prosecutor. He was the first person ever to successfully prosecute a system administrator for ab abusing his authority on his own network at his own company. It was previously thought impossible for anything to be beyond the administrator's role, but he was able to successfully explain to a jury that this guy, even though he didn't lock out the normal users, he had locked out the super users. And that was an unacceptable use of his power. And they said, you'll never be able to explain that to a jury, but he did. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, you got your, your uh, conf configuration, but there's a fundamental problem here. You focus on the important thing, like the new web server selling your new product, and you don't pay attention to the old boring thing that was set up three years ago that everybody forgot about, that nobody's patching or paying attention to. This is how Microsoft got hit. Last month it came out, they, there was an old server without two-factor with high privileges running an old account with a guessable password that they just sort of forgotten about on the network. <laughs> and this tends to happen, you know, just like physically, there's a door somewhere that isn't getting locked properly that nobody ever uses, that nobody notices. Anyway, so that's the problem. You have to figure out what you have. And so there are technical guides to hardened hosts for various purposes. Microsoft makes them and other companies make them, recommending what you should have for a DNS server, what you should have for a mail server, and so on. Um, and then asset management. You have to know what you've got. When was it um, provisioned, put into use? Where is it physical location? Who should we contact about it? Uh, it'd be nice to know what you're doing. At colleges, this happens all the time. They go through network, they try to take stuff down. And I remember at I, I was notifying colleges about their security problems years ago, and I notified the administrator at UC Berkeley, and he said, oh, I know. He said, we can't do anything. The researchers here do crazy stuff. One time, we found malware running around the network, so we blocked that, and then they call, oh, no, we were doing that deliberately to test something. We're like, how am I supposed to secure this network when you lunatics are doing all this crazy stuff? <laughs> we can't block anything. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's the problem. So you got a survey. Um, you, you got to know your operating systems in use, your hardware, the networking, and the diagram, what kind of security software you're using, your management software, your endpoint application, your business applications. You know, you should know all that. And that's why the properly secure shop, they have like only certain things are allowed. Like typically, you'll get a Windows domain controller and you say, you must use the Microsoft everything. Microsoft Teams, no Zoom, Microsoft everything, because that's easiest for us to control and make sure it's patched, and you just can't use anything else because it would drive us all mad trying to figure out if it's secure and cope with it. And now we have a nice Microsoft patch management tool that can enforce it all. That's, that's a lot of why Microsoft makes so much money. They do make that easy. And if you use third-party things, they don't make that easy, especially Apple. Holy cow, Apple does not make it easy. <laughs> um, What's that? It wouldn't be fun if it was easy. Well, you know, that's a good attitude for a Linux system admin. That's half the fun. Is that nothing? <laughs> I remember when I, like, the fifth or seventh time I installed Linux, it finally worked. And after 36 hours, I was able to access a text only chat room. And I felt like a genius. And I said, You could say I'm a complete idiot, too, right? Because I could have done that in five minutes at Windows. But it was so hard to do this way. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, and of course, passwords are such a problem. Passwords are the cheapest and easiest security barrier and the weakest. They just keep getting, people just keep penetrating your passwords. If you really had like 12 or 15 random characters for every like, it'd be pretty good, but nobody does that. Not enough people do. You should use a password manager and let it auto-generate passwords that are long and complicated, but people instead use the name of their dog or the same thing over and over, you know. And so, and, the, and then there are accounts with important privileges used by automatic processes. Those are the service accounts. And people usually don't know how to change the password, don't know how to change it in all the systems that need to have it changed. And it's doing something important, like moving logs or emails from one box to another. And so that's often how the bad guys get in, because it's pretty easy to compromise them. And another thing is if you have images of a hard drive and use the same hard drive image on all your endpoints, it has the same local administrator password on every endpoint. Mm -hmm. And so every one of them, you can get the local administrator password, crack it, now you can get in them all, unless you use a smarter technique than just cloning the hard drive for every box. There is a product called Swarm that will modify the image for every box. And there probably are other ones by now, but I never heard of people using it. Everybody's just using Norton Ghost, where it's an identical drive drive everywhere, and therefore an identical local administrator password everywhere, which is one of the common weaknesses. What do you think is a reasonable uh, password change schedule? Well, this is a very good question. Unfortunately, the U.S. government official specification said you should change your password every 90 days. And right from the start, I remember the first time I heard this, like 15 years ago, I said, what's that going to do? You think if a bad guy steals your password, the fact that he can only exploit your network for 90 days is, <laughs> is, is saving you somehow? They said, what exactly is the threat model whereby this would improve anything? And it turned out there is none. It was just a stupid idea. There is no evidence that it improves anything. In fact, what it does is it lowers your security because it irritates all your users. So they all start writing it down on a post-it or making a pattern, a simple pattern to add, like add a date to the end of it or something. It just, they said you should only change your password when you feel like it was compromised. But however, all my consulting gigs, they all keep making me change my password every 90 days because it's only been like two years since they rescinded this recommendation and it hasn't percolated through the bureaucracy yet. But the fact is, it doesn't make any damn sense. <laughs> and no, I've never heard anybody justify it. And they finally withdrew the recommendation and said, you know, this is not really a best practice anymore. But we've all been doing it for 20 years for no good reason. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, if they, I guess if you're requiring, start requiring a password manager, maybe people will. That would be a good policy. And one of my gigs absolutely requires you not to put your password in a personal password manager, which is not a bad plan. You consider how insecure they are. We'll be hacking into in the instant. And so you must type it in. And even notice if you copy and pasted it in, you have to type it in. Mm -hmm. It's a little app. Yeah, it's pretty annoying. Anyway, anyway, um, so the services are running in the background. On every operating system, there's a bunch of things running in the background, which typically launch before you log in, and they're being used, and they're all running, providing services, and uh, they're, they're sort of like the local API. You might be able to do things like going there. For example, um, Windows XP Home Edition, before Service Pack 1, if you use scheduled tasks, you could just open a command prompt and say at 12.05, run CMD, and when it launched, it would run as administrator. So you could just escalate yourself to administrator or system or something because it used a background service. Uh, they patched that with service pack one, but this kind of thing keeps happening. The one that amazed me, I was actually, the first time I taught the advanced hacking class, I decided, oh, that maybe it was the second time I said, well, we're going to try their operating system. We're going to try Solaris. That's supposed to be secure. And at that time, Solaris had a vulnerability for six months where if you did an R login as root, it would never check the password at all. You just get right in. And it was that way for six months before anybody noticed. Like, holy mackerel. See, 98. <laughs> I know. You can change your password all you want. It wouldn't do a thing. <laughs> anyway, um, so you got uh, now a lot of people keep track of what software they're using just so they can pay the license fees, of course. And then, of course, there's performance monitoring to see if you need to add more server resources because things are bogging down. And your firewalls and AV and access logs and everything should be centrally controlled so you know if somebody's turning off the antivirus or it's crashed on a machine or not getting the updates or something like that. Um, and there's centralized logging systems. There's commercial ones like Splunk and RSA, and there's free ones like Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. This is what Security Onion uses. And those three open source products 
very crudely approximate the functionality of Splunk. Um, and so once you get data, you have to retain it for a period. DSS requires you to retain it for a year, which is really a lot of data storage, <laughs> especially if you're doing network traffic. Um, all right, and so you want on Windows, you want to have log on and log off events. Those are real important because if somebody's trying to sneak in, you need to know who's getting in. Uh, things where they create new users or groups, process creation and termination and so on. Uh, and this is uh, why the tool um, that you add, Sysmon. Sysmon is really good. Sysmon will give you special event logs just with these events and nothing else. They're really, uh, without bothering you with all the other things that are less important. Anyway, on Unix, the same kind of thing, process accounting and forward events to a central logging system. Uh, and for applications, all your, log device, all your devices have, network devices have logs, all your servers have logs. You should be logging DNS queries and DHCP. All those are very important indicators of who people are and what they're doing. DNS logs alone are extremely useful. As long as you outlaw encrypted DNS, you know what everybody's doing. So if anybody's doing anything bad, you have a really easily understood record of who went to the bad place and when they did it. And your antivirus and intrusion protection systems are, of course, going to log their events to a central server. You want to configure them not to delete malware. That could be your evidence. You might need to analyze that. Instead, they should quarantine it somewhere so you can recover it and analyze it. Um, and also, don't automatically transmit suspicious files to a vendor. This is how um, you, you don't want to be sending them off-site without carefully considering that. This is how the Russians stole the NSA's hacking tool to hack routers. And um, a contractor for the NSA took it home and in violation of security policy put it on his home machine. And his home machine had Kaspersky antivirus, which detected the stuff as malware and sent it to Russia. This is... Not good. That's why people ask me what the best antivirus is. And I say, well, the, technically the best antivirus is Kaspersky, but you probably better not use it if you're an American. <laughs> uh, they have the best virus definitions, but we're kind of at war with Russia. You know, you really can't be trusted Russia right now. <laughs> anyway, so. What about their VPN? Could Kaspersky VPN also not? I don't know. Um, I didn't know they had a VPN. I would expect it to be technically excellent, and I would also recommend not using it. I took Telegram. <laughs> I took Telegram off and switched to Signal because it's Russian. I, I, I and yeah. you know, especially when I became a military contractor, I said, you know, I don't want to explain to somebody why I'm sending my stuff to Russia. You know, that just <laughs> seems highly unprofessional. I better not be doing that. <laughs> and. You know, I really don't think TikTok is that big a threat. But anyway, I think adding high-privilege security software from a hostile nation under your device is clearly a bad move. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you have investigative tools. This is the stuff I mentioned, access data enterprise and mandated intelligent response are things that can acquire data over the network in your corporation. Um, and you can also do the same thing with shell scripts and become Windows tools like WMI, but these are the uh, commercial products that will do it. And uh, so you should have a patching solution where you efficiently put on patches, have two-factor authentication. This is a huge step forward. When Google said when they switched to two-factor authentication through everyone with a USB key as the second factor, phishing dropped to zero. They said you never got bit by any more phishing anymore. So that's impressive. Um, and uh, don't have local administrative access for people that don't need it. Have your firewall and AV decommission end-of-life systems. I'm arguing with some of my clients about this. They're using old crap and no one cares as much as me, but it bothers me anyway. <laughs> um, and application whitelisting is we now called application allow listing is the more correct term. And this is actually extremely powerful. And as I discovered a couple weeks ago, this is what Windows S mode does. You buy a brand new Windows 11 home edition laptop, students are coming in, it's in S mode. And S mode will only allow you to use Internet Explorer, no other browser. It will only allow you to install things from the Microsoft Store, nowhere else. And that's a form of whitelisting. That's what iPhones are, right? You can only install from the official store. And the fact is, iPhones are relatively free of malware for that reason. So if you're willing to put up with that limitation, it does make your system a lot cleaner and safer. But that's a pretty severe limitation. And in particular, they can't do their homework in my classes if they can't download things like Wireshark and install it. But anyway, um, and there's recommendations from government agencies. So you should segment your network. Instead of just having one flat network with everything connected, you should have switches and routers dividing it into sections. So your external stuff are up here. Uh, 
public thing, your web services are in a DMZ, separated from other things. Your finance and sales and IT support and internal services are all on separate VLANs and have different security boundaries to limit who goes in there. This is the right way to do it these days. And you should be um, having two-factor authentication for things that cross significant security boundaries. And uh, Microsoft RPC is in particularly dangerous. This is a bunch of ports that are open. It's used in Microsoft services to request a process to launch on another machine. And it's just an endless series of security flaws. Most of the worms spread through this RPC stuff. Uh, it has been a problem. You certainly should never expose this to the internet. And you should be aware that those services have been responsible for a lot of viruses and security problems. And so here's a, the finance department. They recommend you have people come for the employees come in here and the personnel come in through a, a HTTPS a VPN to come into the employee area and uh, there's the employees go one place and accountants go to a different place and they're checked for access to different databases depending on which type they are and so on. You know, you just separate people and uh, then if something bad happens like somebody clicks on this workstation and gets ransomware, you have a limitation how fast it's going to spread and how far it's going to spread. That's the idea. So you have traffic between the zones controlled and so on. And this one mentioned before last time in the Splunk, servers are not allowed to send outboard traffic to the internet. That's a basic hygiene rule. Your servers should be servers and not clients. And that will stop a whole lot of attacks that rely on tricking them into phoning home. And you should have two-factor authentication at all the high-privileged locations. Many people keep doing this. I think some GitHub or something just are going to require two-factor authentication for all account. Because anybody that has just a password, they keep on getting in. It's too easy to find a leak of that password or guess it or brute force it. Two-factor is just becoming more and more common and more and more necessary all over the place these days. Um, don't allow traffic between ports on switches, so if you turn on a file share on an endpoint, you don't let the other endpoints get there, that'll help stop uh, thing, mal malware from spreading from point to point. This is what Starbucks does, by the way. Once Starbucks has scanned the network, if you're at Starbucks, your network consists of you and the router, that's it. Every single customer is on a separate VLAN. This is called host isolation, and it is a good mode. <laughs> you can get to the internet, but you can't get to somebody's file share. It's a good practice. Um, yeah, and uh, they also filter DNS really extravagantly. I mean, I, a DNS security class, students can't do their homework at Starbucks. The DNS is modified and they block all the screwy queries and stuff. So it's a they have pretty good security at Starbucks. They're not messing around. Then um, black holes are an issue. See, if you have a company, you have some IP addresses, public IP addresses, and you're probably not using them all. Like City College has a, a B and a C. We have thousands of addresses. We're not using them all. Now, one thing you could do is just throw away all the traffic going to those other addresses, but it would be better to log it. Anybody trying to use those unused addresses is an attacker scanning your network. So that's useful information. Um, and you can send it. It's an early warning system. And honeypots, uh, that's one simple honeypot. You can also deploy deliberately vulnerable servers to detect attacks. Uh, these are considered to be too much bother and a waste of time. Although, if I was going to do it, I would use Thinkst Canaries. Thinkst Canaries are expensive devices you buy just for this purpose, and then they connect directly to inform you when you get hacked. And one thing that's free, uh, there's free Thinkst Canary tokens. You can go, and they will give you things like email addresses and, and uh, domain names that you can put in your database. And if anybody goes to them, it triggers an alert and tells you. This is I, People should know when you get hacked. You should add Thinks Canary tokens to your data. They just sit there, and you don't use them. But if somebody steals your data and then tries to send spam or something, you say, wait, spam is going to the address. That means somebody hacked us and stole our data. It's, it's free and extremely valuable. It's a shame that companies don't all do it. Canary tokens. Let me just bring it up here because I see people making notes. You may not know about this. Thinks Canary tokens. I had some homework about this in one of some of my classes one time. There, yeah, there are canary tokens, a free tool, so you can discover if you've been breached. You have a web, a URL, a DNS, an AWS key, and a Azure login. Just stick these in your database. You don't use them, but when the bad guys steal your data, they will try to use them, and it'll send a signal back to you. Somebody's using your token, therefore somebody stole your data. Very handy. <laughs> 
Anyway, um, all right, so you got firewalls, IDSs. Uh, you can capture the network traffic with a hardware tap, which is what you have to do, a device that will capture all the network packets and forward them to a device for uh, archiving. And you can have NetFlow emitters, which do not record the, all the network traffic, they record a summary. This IP address went to that IP address, initiated transfer of this many bytes at this time. Just sort of the, uh, they call it the um, TCP phone logs, they call it the pen register data. This is what most people want. The purpose of NetFlow was originally to charge your customers. You would use a protocol that splits up the bandwidth and you people would pay so much per month for a certain amount of bandwidth, and just like the telephone company, you would log how much bandwidth they're they using. And so it's just like the telephone company, you would log how long your phone calls are to where so they can bill you for long distance. So that's what NetFlow is. NetFlow is a summary of your network connections. It's not full packets, so you can't reconstruct files from it or anything. But it's therefore a lot smaller amount of data too. Whole packet captures get really expensive to hold on to because there's way too much data. And proxy servers are, of course, extremely useful. This is the only way to stop your employees from going to bad websites, is to move the default route on the end stations and force them to use the proxy. They cannot get to the internet at all. They can only get to your proxy, and your proxy will only fetch copies of pages that you allow. So you block things, and they really can't get there. That's the idea. And so you should be recording DNS and DHCP. Both of these are very valuable things and not too expensive to recover. And you should have a black hole to redirect malicious server, malicious traffic uh, to addresses you're not using to some server that will record this and then that's useful information. You know who's attacking you. You could use it to, for example, automatically block IP addresses that send traffic to the unused addresses because they're obviously not legitimate customers. They're bad guys, so nuke them. Uh, this is what Bro does. Bro has a new name, uh, Bro's, it's now called Zeek. And we will talk about it later in this class. It's an it's a automatic traffic analysis and blocking system, which is like a smarter firewall developed at uh, over in Berkeley and quite effective. So 3C is here. So they named it Bro, and they decided that was unprofessional, so they changed it to Zeek. Not sis. Z-E-E-K. -E I guess it's no longer sexist, but it still doesn't seem very professional to me anyway. There's something about open source developers, all the caffeine late at night, everything is all full of inside jokes. What's that? I don't think I have. Brotopia. Put it on your list. Okay. Yeah, sounds like good job. I, I remember uh, Kara Swisher uh, said she can't, uh, several people I say, say, I can't watch the show Silicon Valley because it's all true. It's so true it hurts too much. <laughs> I mean, I remember when Yahoo first came out and that banks first found out about internet culture, they said, you guys don't make a profit? You just get drunk on the job? What's going on here? This will never work. And then it worked and that just made them matter, you know. We have to wear a suit and go to school and be grown up, and you can just be an idiot like that and make all this money. <laughs> I remember a guy applied for a job at Yahoo. So we went in there, they were playing ping pong. I said, okay, take a racket. If you beat me at ping pong, you're hired. That was how. Just do stuff like that, you know. It's like, it's as if they were a bunch of drunk children pretending to run a company. It's a whole lot like that. <laughs> And crypto is those same people pretending to run a bank. Yeah, which is scary. <laughs> I actually worked at financial companies. Anybody that's actually worked in financial companies is like beyond horrified at crypto. Holy crap. Especially when I started learning crypto and programming it and seeing what they've done. It's like, oh my God. I mean, we were careful. And these guys are so not careful. <laughs> Handling billions of dollars and just throwing it around with crappy software and bad practices. It makes you sick. sick. And they're going to prison now for it, so, you know. See, CZ could have got away with it if he had really seriously not let Americans use his service. But he did. And America has laws about this stuff. Anyway, let's give it a shot. All right, 
which passwords are difficult to change. Which one of these destroys evidence? Okay, the antivirus tends to delete things it thinks of as bad. So which log is essential to identify what systems are using your IP addresses? does is give you the MAC address, and the MAC address can be changed too. In fact, at one time this college authenticated authorized users on the Wi-Fi by MAC address, but they only give you two MAC addresses each. So I just changed one of my authorized MAC addresses to AAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAA